Well, welcome, church family. Welcome to worship this morning. So glad that you would take the time to gather. We're a church that values the presence of God. And that means this morning that we're coming to Jesus with intention. We're coming to him with expectation because we know that when we begin to declare things that are truth about him, that the atmosphere begins to shift even in a small way in our lives, in our homes, in our relationships. So let the joy rise up this morning. Maybe it's been a tough week. Maybe it's been a good week. But we're in the presence of God. It's time to take joy as his people. He's bringing freedom and life and goodness in this place this morning. Let's do this. Take 15 seconds, 20 seconds this morning. Let the joy rise up in your hearts. Let the thanks, the thanksgiving for what he's done begin to rise up in your hearts. We're going to come to him today with hearts full of worship. Yeah, we thank you, Lord, today. We just say, Jesus, you are worthy. You're the name above every other name. Your name is life. Your name is peace, and it's hope inside of us. And we sing it with confidence and victory today. Amen. We sing, our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, and Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Lifting up a song of his victory today. Hmm. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Come on, let's sing it out today. Descended into darkness, he rose in glorious light. Forever seated high, we declare, I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name Is Lord. I believe in your name, and I believe in you, yeah. And I believe you rose again, and I believe that Jesus Christ. It's a redemption song today, rising up from our hearts, rising up from the depths of our hearts today, for the glory of Jesus, for the glory of our Jesus today. I believe in life 
eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of I believe. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection when we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the Come so 
take a moment as Melissa plays, as we sing out this morning, let's take a moment just to express in our own words to God just how very, very good he's been. It doesn't have to be eloquent this morning, but if you can, if you can this morning, if there's breath in your lungs, just lift your voice. Maybe in a song, maybe it's just in a simple prayer this morning. Oh, we love you, Jesus. The author of every good thing in my life. The shield from every form of darkness. Oh, how we love you. And now we respond, we sing. Our affection, our devotion, poured out on the feet of Jesus. Our affection, our devotion, Poured out on the feet of Jesus Our affection, our devotion Poured out on the feet of Jesus Our affection, our devotion Poured out on the feet of Jesus we just like the woman anointed and washed your feet with perfume and her hair and her tears. This morning we come to you vulnerably and we give you a piece of our heart. We give you a piece of our life this morning in our worship. We pray then at this time as we hear from your word that you'd soften our hearts. Because you are the God who is a king. You're the God who's a shield, but you're also the God who is a friend and a comforter this morning. Soften our hearts to hear what you have to say. Let it take root in our lives. In Jesus' name, we say amen. Well, good morning, church fam. So good to be here with you this morning. We're going to get started with our message in just a second. Well, a good Sunday morning to you. Thank you for joining us for Online Church. I'm thrilled to be able to spend this time together with you. By the way, if you are interested in joining us for next Sunday in-person gathering uh, in our new auditorium, uh, registration is open right now. In fact, there's information on your screen. You can log on and reserve your spot for next Sunday. We'd love to have you here. Uh, also, there's a way for you to interact while you are at home. You can greet people as you sign on in the comments section. If there's something that you uh, think find encouraging, you can actually acknowledge that. It's a great way to connect with people even while you are home. So this morning we're launching a brand new series. And the series is about how we sanctify our home. So what does that concept mean? And why is that uh, an important thing for us? Well, the concept is that you, you set apart something for God's purposes, not just your own. That's what sanctify means, it consecrate it. And then secondly, we have a brand new space to worship in. We want to set this aside, set it apart for God's purpose. But I don't want us just to think about this space. I want you to think about the space you're at right now. Because your home, the place you live, can be set apart for the purposes of God. 
So we're starting a series about that this morning. Uh, here's the first thing I want to call to our attention. How we see God affects how we see everything and everyone else. How you see God affects how you see everything and everyone else. In our culture right now, you've probably picked up on the fact that there's a lot of hopelessness. There's a lot of frustration, a lot of fear, a lot of anger, a lot of accusation. And um, you hear people talk about it in very disheartened ways. And what I want you to know is that the way we see the culture around us has less to do with what they are doing and what we are seeing in God. The more clearly we see God, the more different we will see the things and the individuals around us. Some people see God as very disinterested. He's kind of taking his hands off and he's absent from the human equation. Other people see things that are happening in our culture right now as kind of the punishment of God that, that he's bringing upon us because we've stepped out of bounds. There, there are, of course, others that don't even believe that God exists. So there's no interest in approaching a God that you don't think exists. Our world also does not believe that people can change. Our worst moment is, becomes our lifetime label. Your worst moment, the world actually thinks, is who you really are. And everything else is pretending. The reason people do not believe others can change is because they have not changed. The reason people believe others have not changed is because they have not changed. And I think church is where change can actually occur, where people's lives can be not just informed, but transformed by grace and by truth. So we're going to look at a really powerful passage in scripture where something is happening that's not dissimilar from what we're doing today. It's 2 Chronicles, the seventh chapter, and King Solomon is consecrating, he's sanctifying, he's separating unto the purpose of God a temple which he has built for God. And this is what it says, beginning in verse 1. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. He is good. His love endures forever. And the Lord appeared to Solomon at night and said, I heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. This is actually the second great undertaking of creating a sacred space. The first great undertaking was accomplished by Moses. He built a tabernacle. It was a, a portable temple. It was made out of fabric, and they could move wherever they were wandering through the wilderness. And now there's Solomon's temple. And this is something that's more permanent, and it's made out of stone and wood. And he builds this incredible place and, and spared no expense. It was a phenomenal accomplishment. And then he prayed and he offered sacrifices there, acknowledging that this place was for God's divine purpose. That's why it's here. He's not trying to put God in a box. He's not trying to limit God to a time and a space. He's just simply saying, this can be a place where people can connect with God. So he's trying to create a connection point for people. And when Solomon finished praying, something remarkable happened. Fire appeared in the temple, and it fell upon the sacrifice and began to consume it. 
and God's glory filled the temple. And, and some people might wonder, well, what does that mean? Well, it was something observable, but it wasn't just like a mystical mist. It's actually a sense of God's presence that was palpable. It felt tangible. And a release of God's blessing. That people knew that God was there and that his intent was to be a blessing, to pour blessing into people's lives. And everyone who saw this, everyone who saw this example of God, they fell down and they put into words what they had seen. And this is what they said. Yes, God is good. His love never quits. And they just keep saying it. They get a vision of what God is like. And they just fall on their face. And they just keep repeating it. Yes, God is good. Yes, his love never quits. That beginning perspective, that lens through which you begin to see everything else changes how you see everything else. We are attempting to create a space for people to connect with God. That's why we built this expansion. That's why we added space so that more people could experience the grace of God for themselves. And we ask God to sanctify this space, to, to set this space apart for his purpose. And I want you to know that that is for where we gather. We want people to connect with God here, but it's also for where you live. That God does not reserve himself to just spaces that people congregate in on one day of the week. That your house can be set apart for the purpose of God. So what does it mean to, to call something a house? Well, uh, first of all, we know it's an actual physical address. I know there are lots of people who believe that the true spirituality is actually absent of any geographical reality, that, that truly spiritual people don't show up at any one place or any one time. But scripture actually doesn't call that or tell us that. And in fact, uh, community is a huge thing that Christianity and God talks about. And so it's something that you can't do without being together. And so there's a physical address. And in fact, when Moses was building that first tabernacle, God said, this is the space, this is the sanctuary where I will meet with people and I will give you commands. I will direct you from here. So it's a really powerful place. The second concept of house is not just a physical address, but it's also relationships. For example, uh, Paul is preaching the gospel to someone, and, and he tells them this. He says, today, uh, uh, the salvation has come to this household. So the concept there is that it's relationships. It's not just an address. It's also the people who live there and are relationally connected with each other. And then the third thing is a house is a set of responsibilities. Because if you live in a physical address with people you have a relationship with, everybody has to carry some part of the responsibilities. So the whole thing just doesn't get overrun with chaos or rot and, and decay. And so everyone takes on responsibilities. Uh, it talks about this in, in Hebrews uh, chapter 3, where it says Moses was faithful in the house of God. It's talking about his responsibilities. And then a house is also the reach of your influence. It's absolutely astonishing to me how often we surrender to the idea that you have to have a certain amount of wealth or you have to have a significant title. You have to have something that other people will recognize as important and that's how you gain your influence. But I can tell you that there are people who have no title and virtually no resource, sometimes not enough health to move out of their bed and they can have incredible influence on people. I've officiated funerals where people had long-term illnesses and watched doctors and, and nurses and family members and friends give testimony to a fact that a person who had nothing, including not enough health to stand and walk, was a huge influence in their life. And this idea that a house can also be an influence. Once again, not just where we gather, but also where you live. You can be an influence for the kingdom of God right where you are. Now, when the fire began to appear and then fall on the sacrifice, it would remind the Israelites of, of a very important part of their history. And that was when they were leaving the land of bondage in Egypt and they were beginning their journey towards a promised land. And uh, God actually guided them with a pillar of cloud and of fire. 
And this is a really interesting concept. It, it would light the way for them to go, but it would also illuminate their life together. Um, I've, I've seen quite a few examples of this just kind of going through uh, uh, social media. And that is a number of people these nights are gathering around a little fire pit and, and, and throwing uh, some, some logs in there and, and lighting a fire. And where there is a fire, people just kind of gather around. And this is what God is doing. He, he's letting them know, I'm going to light the way for you from this spot. And this is a place where you can gather around. Something remarkable can happen here. People are making place for God. And God is taking his rightful place among them, which leads me to this point. For God to take his place in our home, we need to see who he really is. Until you see God for who he really is, you're not going to give him much space or place in your life or your home. But once you see him for who he is, you just find yourself saying it over and over again. Yes, he is good. Yes, his love never stops. We need to see God for who he is. There's not a shortage of unflattering views of God in our world. He gets blamed for most of the things that go wrong. He doesn't get credit for hardly anything that goes right. There are people who see God as, as judgmental and unconcerned, and overbearing and limiting, like God is limiting my life in some way. And if that's your view of God, you're never going to welcome him into your life or into your home, to any part of any place that you go to. But if we desire a tangible expression of God, something that's more than just a history of someone else's experience, we begin by welcoming, welcoming him into our home. God desires to draw near. God delights in connecting with us. God takes pleasure in releasing the resources of heaven into our lives. This is what I want you to hear. The reluctance on a connection with God is never on God's part. It's always on our part. He pursues us. He takes delight in connecting with us. He takes delight in spending time with us. He takes delight in blessing us and pouring the resources of heaven into us. So to sanctify our home, we must overcome our barriers to intimacy with God. And here's what I will tell you. It's really easy to withhold any expression towards God because of our own sense of feeling silly, or we're not good at it, or we're not worthy of it. And so we just kind of, we, we just step back and withdraw. Remember, it's we who are reluctant, not God. But we can overcome that. The only use our world has for God in its broken state is to blame him for something that's gone wrong. They literally call it an act of God when something so horrific goes wrong that you can't actually hold a person accountable for it. They call it an act of God. Or they ask him to damn something that frustrates them. This is how the world views God. Jesus came, and this is what's fascinating, is he came to take the blame for all the sin upon himself. And Jesus bore the curse and the wrath of God while he was on the cross. But that's not all Jesus came to do. Jesus tells us in Luke 19, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Look at God. He's in pursuit mode. He's coming after us. He's seeking and saving those of us who are lost. And in John 10, he says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus has come to seek and to save. Jesus has come to recover and restore all that God intends for us. He's come to do more. Jesus has come to undo the things that are undoing us. He's come to, to connect us with his heavenly father. He's come to release the resources of heaven into our lives. All we need to be is hungry and humble to desire him and to welcome him. This is what makes the difference. So worship is how we welcome God to meet with us. Let me say that again. Worship is how we welcome God to meet with us. 
Prayer is how we extend the blessings of heaven to the broken in our world. So worship welcomes God to meet with us. Prayer helps us extend the blessings of God to others who are broken in our world. And here's what I want you to see. We'll never see our world, our lives, or our homes the way God sees them until we change how we see God. This isn't a mind game. This isn't a trick. It isn't a delusion. It's not looking out the same window and just deciding to see something different. Once you see God for who he is, you see it differently. It has a real lasting impact on you. So do you want to meet with God? Do you want the resources of heaven to flow into your life and extend to those individuals that you love and to the situations that you have responsibilities for? There's a couple of things I'd recommend for you. Uh, by the way, I've actually seen people do this in public spaces, though it's a little harder to do right now, but I'm sure it'll happen again. Uh, maybe you go to a restaurant and you have some friends that are already there and they're waiting for you. And when you walk in, they notice you. And what do they do? They raise their hand. And they want to get your attention. They're letting you know, I'm here. Right? I'm here. And then they'll lift their voice to invite you over. I think that we can do that in worship. A lifted hand calls attention. I'm here. A lifted voice extends an invitation. You're welcome to join me. And something remarkable begins to happen. Real transformation, real change begins to happen in our world, in our lives. We find ourselves in that exchange with God, coming to a fresh realization. Yes, you are good. Your love never stops. When that happens, now you actually begin to see what's possible, not just what's wrong. See, all the voices you hear right now about, oh, this is wrong, and this is terrible, and this is bad, and, and what I can tell you is they're watching a lot of television, but they're not looking for God. When you begin to look for God, you begin to see things differently. Now you see what could happen under heaven's influence, not just what has happened under a sinful influence in a broken world. Grace becomes the invasion force that brings transformation into our world. A hand raised, God, I am here, and a voice raised, you are welcome to join me. It can make all the difference in the world. And that's what I'm asking you to do. Even in your home right now, a hand raised, God, I'm here, right here, right now. And I want your presence, I want your spirit to be in this place. I want every single person who has any connection with the place I live, I want every single one of them to see you for who you really are. Yes, God, you are good. And your love never stops. Let's pray. Uh, Father, It's hard to get some sights and sounds out of our minds. It's hard to see things the way you do and say things the way you would say them. But you've called us to be seers and sayers, to see things that others don't see because we've been in contact with the God of heaven and earth and to say things that others don't say because we've been given life and freedom in you. Would you help us wherever we go to welcome you into that space so that every arena of our life can be a connection point for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
says, I am here. An open hand says, I will share. Once you realize who God is and that he is good and he is gracious and he is generous, you're willing to partner with him in what he wants to do in the world. So Heavenly Father, we don't just raise our hand to say we're here. We open our hand and we share what you have so generously granted to us. Use it for your purpose. Sanctify this gift. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning for Church Online. Uh, before you go, I just want to let you know of an opportunity coming up to serve both our global and our local communities. We are going to run a school supply drive from July 27th to July 31st. And our vision for this this year is around the globe and around the block. And so how this is going to work is some of the donations and the supplies that are donated are going to go to a couple of schools in Jamaica that we've partnered with in the past. But this year, in addition to that, we're also going to donate some of the supplies that are given to students over at Churchville Chilai Central School District. And we want to be bold about the fact that God has placed us in this community and we want to make a difference in the lives of the students. And we want to build relationships with the students at Churchville Chilai. So I encourage you. If you have the opportunity, go out, get some school supplies and drop them off at the church between July 27th and July 31st. And you'll see a complete list of supplies that you can bring on our website and also on our social media. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. And I hope you have a blessed Sunday and a